Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks, and today I'm joined by the Urban Birder, a.k.a. David Lindo. But first we're going to cover a little bit about the news, and I thought I'd talk about murder hornets, which is a kind of sensationalist name for these animals, but in America, two of these hornets were found, and, well, America and Canada, and they get up to four centimetres long, and these are the Asian giant hornet aka murder hornet and although its sting can be fatal to humans it's very rare that they kill people the news has just grabbed onto this and they've gone absolutely nuts as they often do now none of them have ever been found in europe so far but there are asian hornets which are a different species they've just lose the giant out of the name it's slightly smaller and that is spreading across france and the Channel Islands, and there have been some nests found, worryingly, in the UK, and the worry is that these hornets predate bee nests, so our honeybees could be under threat from these. So if you do see a a non-native hornet, because of course there is the European hornet to add into the mix, which is, you know, that should be here, but you've got Asian hornets, which predate bees, and then you've got these giant hornets, which are obviously kind of another level of just arseholery. I don't think that's a word, but you get my meaning of attacking native insects. But let's go on to our guest, David Lindo. He's got multiple accolades, including working on various natural history programs, writing columns for Nature's Home, the magazine for the RSPB, Birdwatching Magazine and Birdwatcher Digest, and was even named the seventh most influential person in wildlife by BBC Wildlife magazine. And there's much more to him than that as well. Now, I wanted to find out a little bit more about David. Okay, David, well, thanks for joining me. You're very welcome, Jack. Thank you very much. With the tables have turned. I was, uh, you were interviewing me last week and now uh, I'm interviewing you. So for the In Conservation series, as you say, if anyone's interested in that, there's some great webinars there to check out. Not only mine, obviously mine's probably the best, but there's some other ones on there that are, that are pretty good. I think we should start at the beginning, David. So where did the urban birder come from? It was born, uh, well, the, yeah, the urban birder Monica was born 16 years ago. And basically I was invited on to, um, I had an email from the BBC asking me to, if I wanted to go on Spring Watch to talk about uh, watching birds on my then local patch, Roman Scrubs. And of course I said yes. And then the night before the shoot, I, I went to a salubrious hotel in Acton, West London. And for those who know, Acton will know that there's hardly any salubrious hotels, if, you know, if any, in Acton. So it's some dump, really. But anyway, I met the, the, um, the crew and the director said to me, tomorrow I want you to go out and be yourself and tell us what you know and not worry about it and enjoy it and all that sort of stuff, which was fine. And then she then asked me, um, can, you know, she said, um, can, we, can we actually do a, you know, like a little teaser with you? And I'm thinking, really? Me? So I remember going home and I was pacing up and down in the kitchen thinking, what can I say? What can I do, you know, to make myself stand out in the screen test? I just thought to myself, you know, I'd love to be like another David Attenborough clambering over rocks in the Galapagos and plowing through jungles in the nicest possible way in Peru. But then I thought that's not going to happen. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe I could concentrate on what I like. I like urban wildlife. I like birds, urban birds. And then I thought about um, Jamie Oliver, who at the time um, was called the Naked Chef and since has become a really nice friend of mine. But at the time, he's a Naked Chef. And I loved what he did for cooking. He came along and he opened it up for a lot of people like myself who had no interest, you know, who had, you know, as much as, you know, you may have respected Fanny Craddock, you kind of didn't get inspired. inspired. Whereas with him, he'd come along and he's really brought brought it to a new audience. And I wanted to do do the same, but for birds. So I thought maybe I'd give myself a moniker because no one else had a moniker at the time. In fact, very few people have to this day, actually. I mean, there was a little surge at the time, actually, when I first became the other birder, but then after this it's kind of died down. But anyway, I thought myself the city birder, hmm. (laughs) What about the urban birder? That sounds all right. So the next day I introduced myself as the urban birder. They used it in the cut when it came out. And uh, basically 
everyone sort of contact me, you know, oh my God, what a cool name, you know, it's really cool. And I thought to myself, yeah, maybe I'll use it as a, as a way of getting into TV, um, as a, you know, as a, as, as a door opener. And I remember, oh, is that me? I remember, <laughs> I remember. We, did, we said this just before we started, didn't we? <laughs> no worries. No worries, David. No one's perfect. <laughs> no more emails. Um, I remember um, going, um, yeah, I remember ringing up when I first started, you know, on this road, ringing up the BBC trying to pitch for them to see me and to have a TV programme. And they say, who's calling? I say, the urban birder. And normally people will laugh at me on the other end of the phone. But after six months, people started calling me the urban birder. And that's where it kind of was born. And it was, I suppose, initially meant to be temporary. And I saw it as an alter ego. But then after a while, when I realised just how difficult it was to get to TV and how much of a sliver the open window of opportunity was, and I also realised that I needed to, to do other things, like writing and, you know, all the other bits and pieces, touring, that I realised that the urban birder actually described very well what I was about in three words. The other thing was, which not many people know, there is actually two other urban birders in existence before me. That All right. Birder. Do you get an exclusive here, Jack? <laughs> um, one is in Melbourne and the other one uh, is in America. Both of them write about essentially their towns um, and about the urban, the big blogs basically about the urban birds. So the reason why I call myself the urban birder was not out of arrogance, but as a point of difference to those two. Have you had contact with those two? Yeah, the one in Melbourne, I don't know if he exists anymore in terms of you know, doing that, but the one in America, I've actually, we are Facebook friends. So does it bother you at all being typecast with urban birds? Because I know you pose a similar question to me about being lumped with fish all the time, which you know, I don't mind too much, but is it, is it a, a grinding thing for you or do you kind of embrace it? Like, what, What's your thoughts? Well, I think at the time I was aware that it would mean that I'd be typecast. My background, by the way, is in advertising and sales and marketing and stuff like that. So I'm very used to stuff behind the camera. And that, you know, towards the kind of end of that situation, I was working a lot in film, on the outskirts of film anyway. So I understood the principles of, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I knew that by calling myself the urban birder would mean that I would be sort of typecast. But then I thought, you know what, that's not a problem because there's no one else doing what I want to do, even to this day. There's no one else doing what I like to do on a global level. I knew that the, a lot of the media, they are very kind of, they just think in boxes. And I don't think really creatively, so they kind of just think you just do urban and that stuff. I think over time, people have realised that, you know, you can do other things as well. But even so, they're still typecast initially in urban, which is fine. But the thing is, I'm not here for TV. I'm not here to, to pander to what they want or, you know, I'm here for a much bigger reason, which as far as I'm concerned is to try and engage with as many people as possible, not just in the UK, but around the world. And I think using a, uh, using the, the moniker, the Alberta actually helps me because immediately people know, looking at that, those three words, what it means straight away. And it's, it's, you know, for some people it's quite, well, that's interesting, let's talk to him. You know, it's, it's a good way of getting introductions really. So I'm really happy that I thought of that and I'm happy that it was very pertinent and I'm happy that even to this day, it's still very relevant. Um, I thought that by now it may have switched and I'm, you know, at the time, in, in the beginning, that I'm more known as David Lindo. I think maybe I'm known equally, I don't know. Do you think more people know you as David Lindo or the Urban Birder? But I guess it doesn't really, I mean, it's both going to lead to you anyway, isn't it? But. I think more people probably do know you as David Lindo uh, as, as your yeah, career's advanced. I, I think people know me as both because they say it all in one lump. I mean, especially abroad, you know, when I'm in Spain or South America or wherever I am, I'm known as my name and then the, the moniker, which is almost like your name and then your job title. So that's how people know you. And I'm happy and I'm really, I'm really delighted actually. I, I kind of thought that idea because it was all part of the plan because I want to try and popularise birding. And I think the best way to do it is to pander in a way 
uh, to the sensibilities of the media who need these catchy things in order to get their head around stuff. And my idea was to sell the idea of burning as a lifestyle choice up there mm. with yoga and meditation and Pilates. I see myself as an introducer. I'm all about trying to get people interested um, from a very basic level uh, and then taking them to the bridge, which they can then cross over and enter the world of conservation and get involved or just walk past the bridge, but at least they know that it's there. So that's, that's my role, I think, as, as I see things. So I'm quite a populist, popularist, which to some of the traditionalists and el more elite people in the birding world, they, they can't get their heads around and not into. I remember when my German book came out, hashtag urban birding, the publisher was frantically trying to get me interviews and they approached um, some sort of venerable, in inverted commas, um, point <laughs> project people in, in northern Germany in the town and said, well, oh no, that's, we don't, Urban burning is just not proper burning. We're not interested in that. You know, we, we, we do proper bird watching here. You know, so you get the old school who still think that way. But to be honest with you, I'm not that interested in them because, you know, as I said, my target audience are people who never considered it before. They're my prime target audience. Well, I'm glad you've said that because my next question was going to be, do you think there are any misconceptions about going to urban places to go birding, which you've, you've sort of touched on already. But so there's always a snobbery, is there then? People are like, oh, I'm not going to go into a you know, city for that. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, especially when I first started actively being the urban birder, I think a lot of people were saying I stopped real birding, you know, and even people that lived in cities that tended to then go off into the countryside to go birding. So the city was not somewhere they'd even consider. Whereas I found it fascinating because there's so much to be found in, in urban areas. And also, I found even in London in the very beginning that people were saying, oh, you've, you've seen all these birds at Wormwood Scrubs, but it's an accident. They're just passing through by accident. <laughs> I'm saying, well, actually, no, they, they actually migrate through here. You know, and some people even went as far. You know, it's a typical crap you hear about. Oh, he's just adding extra zeros in his numbers of mellow pippy CCs. But then they come and then they find out for themselves that actually that's what's happening. Yeah. So yeah, there is there is that, and also you, you it makes you feel more and more like a, an urban explorer because I've been to over three hundred and fifty different cities and towns since I started the urban bird I think sixteen years ago, and for many of them, if you Google them prior to visiting, there's nothing there at all. I mean, even famous places. Like I remember going to Seville two years ago. There's nothing. Absolutely, you Google Seville. I mean, there is now, but before then, there's nothing other than Cota de Niana, which is, you know, 20, 30 miles away. And when I first started, I was really annoyed when Paul Milne, who's, I'm sure, a lovely guy, I don't, I don't know if I know him, but he put out a book called um, Where to Watch Birds in the World's Towns and Cities. Okay. And then when I looked at the book, it was all sites which were literally 100, 200 kilometers outside of the city. And I'm thinking, you know, what a waste of a title. I could have written something that, you know, actually did that. And so I was, you know, even people who wrote about urban birding back then didn't really understand what it was. And I think I'm, it's, it's, I've been trying to change the mindset for, for some time now, just trying to get people to think differently. But the main reason why I do all this is purely to sow a seed to get people to love their environment from their doorstep, to try and get them to understand that conservation starts from the doorstep. And if you can get all those people interested, as you know, in the UK, 82% of people live in cities and towns. And I find that a lot of the media and, you know, they talk to the 21% the, the who live out in the countryside. They should be talking to people in urban areas. And I think, for example, they've missed the trick with the COVID-19, a fantastic opportunity to, get a cameraman out of a camera, shooting from the hip. This is what I've seen in Ellsbury this afternoon, you know? And even if it's song thrushes, blackbirds, I mean, that's a great place to start because you can give them, you give people a backstory about these birds, you know, to get them on the road to being interested. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's a vital thing. And it feeds very nicely into this whole situation when it comes to diversity in, nature as well in terms of people because again you know I've been listening to what a lot of people have been saying on, on social media and TV about the subject and all of them seem to be sort of pointing fingers at NGOs saying they should be doing more 
and you know also talking about racism blah 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 but i think one of the big reasons is the way that nature is sold is sold on tv still as a domain of white middle class so therefore regardless of what color creed you are if you're in a city and you see that sort of thing you think you know what that's not for me this is this is my hood I, you know I hang out here there's no nature here i just do what i need to do with my iphone and what have you and that's that so i think it, it's, it's that, that needs to be looked at because that singularly is a massive way of getting people to change their, their thoughts on you know what what nature means and i think again that's another massive trick that you missed I guess as well, it's being labelled as well. Like there are probably people who are interested of, of all different, you know, creeds, religions, race, whatever, who are interested in nature, but they don't label themselves as a birder. You know, whether it's just like, oh, look at that, and they just take a picture on their phone. There's that spark of interest in in wildlife in the outdoors, but I guess they don't see themselves as a big floppy hat camo wearing person going out after it. But as as you said as well in the past, you don't have to wear all that clobber to enjoy the wildlife as well. You can just wear whatever and get stuck into these urban environments. Yeah, totally. And I also think that um, another barrier is the fact that people think that they have to be an expert. Yeah. And, and that's something that needs to be worked on, you know, by the NGOs and everyone in terms of trying to show, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to have to read the book. I remember once being on Country File and Julia Bradbury asked me, you know, what can I do to be a bird? And I said, well, all you need to do is open your mind and get yourself tuned into the natural wavelength and not worry about what you're looking at just enjoy it and then over a period of time you know if you want to then through osmosis and through your own sort of way of doing it and your own time you can learn about what you're watching and i got lampooned by several people who said how dare you you should be getting them to read the collins guide of britain's but you know I'm thinking, no, that's not the way to do it. It's, it's, that is work, you know, and it, it's fine if you want to be that way inclined, that's cool, but we've got to accept that there's going to be a lot of people out there casually interested, and they're the most important people in many ways, because they are who I term as the conservation army. They're the people that we need to be galvanizing, so that when there is a need, when a petition needs to be signed, when money needs to be raised, when, you know, people need to be shouting in the streets. They're the people we need to get out there who understand that there's an environment. They may not necessarily be experts, they may not own a pair of binoculars or whatever, but they have uh, an empathy. And that's what we should be trying to encourage, empathy. So my, uh, my partner is not remotely interested in, in wildlife really, not particularly, which is weird why we're kind of opposites, but there was a, a natural world a few years ago about London. I don't know if you might've been involved by, perhaps, but it was, um, just doing about the whole city of London, all these different wildlife stories. And we watched it together and she watched the Greaves. I can't remember whereabouts it was, but they were doing the dance and doing the weed and all that. And I could just see her eyes kind of slowly turn to the screen and she was engaged with this. And now whenever we go somewhere where there's water, it's like, oh, will, will we see a Greave? And even though she's not, you know, she doesn't know the scientific names or she doesn't know the life history, but there's that little, little kind of eye will move up to be interested yeah. in that. So yeah, I think you need to encourage it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's very important. And as I say, it's something that I've noticed in the arguments I've been listening to that's been overlooked. I think the answer is often, or well, part of the answer is often very simple. You know, people are getting very complex about it all and they are using excuses or reasons which I find are too lazy to be just liberally put across everything because I think everyone's got different experiences. Um, you know, I've, I've been birding since I was five and I, I, I've been out in the countryside in, during the times when it was the most racist in Britain, you know, for a long time. And even despite that, I never, you know, when I was in the countryside, I was fine. I never actually received any racism in the countryside. And the racism I got, most of it was actually in, in the very place that I was hanging out in, the cities, you know? Yeah. So it's quite interesting. And... Um, yeah, I think that there's a, it's a complex conversation, but anyway, going back to the, the, the basics of what, what we're talking about, I think it's about just getting people to understand that they can get involved without the need for knowledge. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, I, I read on your website, am I right in saying that you're the founder of Tower 42 Birding? Or you were, you were in the conception of it, is that right? 
I was the founder of the Tower 42 Bird Study Group, yeah. Yeah, and that still goes on to this day, doesn't it? People go up to the top of the building or no, does no, it not? No, unfortunately about three or four years ago, uh, the, the building had a new owner. Oh, who was okay. Money motivated. And we would go up every spring and autumn once a week for four or five weeks. And one particular year, he refused to pay for the um, public liability insurance. So then I said, well, I'll pay it. And how much is it? It turned out to be 300 quid. Right. Um, so he was embarrassed into paying it, obviously. Yeah. And then the, the following year, he came up with another excuse. And then we were, we were being sort of kicked off, basically. Oh, that's so such a shame. We were doing no harm whatsoever. In fact, we were doing good for the building because we were, you know, people were getting to know about building worldwide. And it was a good sort of green glossing for them. But he was more interested in money and had no kind of, you know, interest or leaning towards nature at all. Oh, that's such a shame. I mean, I remember seeing that because it was featured on quite a few programs, isn't it? Like, I know, like, with you in particular, would be on that, but you'd be this fantastic London skyline. Um, and I was reading up on, I think it was Bird Guides or Rare Bird Alert, one of them. But some of the stuff you saw up there was like, that's flying over London? That's bonkers, you know, like... Uh, yeah, we, we had um, honey buzzards, um, hen harrier, marsh harrier, you know, common buzzards as well, hobby, and then a few kind of local scarcities, you know, central London, like Hitty Wake, uh, Sandwich Turn, Rook. You know, we had an amazing array of stuff flying over but it was tough because you'd go up there and we only had that one day um so we couldn't really sort of work around the weather sometimes we'd have to abandon because the weather wasn't good and and you may spend hours seeing nothing it's like watching the sea you know you just spend hours looking at waves and all of a sudden you see something um it's the same with looking on top of that building you, you look across the expanses of london and what i'd say to people was just have a look see where you live, see where your mum lives and all that sort of stuff, get over that, then work out landmarks. There's, there's the, uh, the wheel, the big wheel, there's Wembley Stadium there. So work out where, you know, the points of the compass are. So if you, when you do see something, keep your eye on it and don't, don't take your eye off. Because once you take your eye off, it just disappears. So that's how we pick up red kites drifting over in the distance or, you know, that sort of stuff. And even when things are flying overhead, sometimes you'd never see them. We were 600 feet up. And I, especially on a sunny day with nice fluffy clouds, I know that there's thermals and that's what the raptors used to ride on. So sometimes I'd lie on my back and just look up. And I remember one time I was doing that, one time doing that, and seeing a tiny speck, which was a sparrowhawk migrating. And it must have been, well, it must have been at least three times higher than what we were. It was a speck. Wow. Uh, and another time I found a kettle of six or seven buzzards. Again, specks, just circling across and drifting. So these birds must be fresh in from the continent uh, and moving across, you know, to Scandinavia and what have you. So it's incredible when you think what actually passes overhead, even in an urban area. Because at the end of the day, these birds are following routes that they've been following for eons. And as a child, I used to think, oh, birds must fly around cities, you know. But I don't actually carry on the same route they've tried, they've flied for years. I mean. You see that elsewhere when you go to other other countries and you know you look up in northern europe in a city and you see skeins of geese i mean i've been to in new york and i've seen skeins of snow geese flying across you know it's amazing to, to stand in manhattan and see geese flying yeah you know yeah, yeah. skyscrapers it's you know incredible. and there's no there's not been like a substitute has there been another tower that's allowed people up or is it just something that no one's really pursued i think there was probably some Substitutes. I mean, I have, I've been actually I've been offered a couple of other um, um, roofs, but the problem is um, towards the end. I mean, I, we did the Tower Forty Two thing for nine years, yeah. and for the first couple of years, it was fine because I was around. But I got busier and busier, um, and the trouble I had was finding people to take on the project and, and, and just carry it on for us. People were happy to come when we saw stuff, but it's hard to drum up interest when we had a couple of weeks and not seen anything yeah. which kind of made me despair about birders per se because i think a lot of birders um tend to just go to places where they are guaranteed to see something um there's not a lot of there's not a lot of the finding mentality going on there's more a lot there's a lot of people following but very few finders instant um, gratitude sort of thing 
Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you go to places like Iceland, for example, and the birders there, they are finders because they've only got X amount of species they can see anyway. And thereafter, you have to find new things. And that mentality is great. I mean, there's a guy that I interviewed the other day called Silas Olofsson, who, um, who basically um, is from the Faroe Islands, but he lives in, he now lives in Mo uh, Mongolia for the time being. And I loved his attitude when I met him because he would look at every bush. He would get to the hundredth bush and you and I would say, you know what, <laughs> I've hit a wall, I'm going. He would carry on until he found something. And that's, that attitude is fantastic because the more you work, the more you find. But not everyone's like that. As you say, everyone, yeah. some people like instant gratitude. They want to go to a reserve where they know they'll see Avocet and all that sort of stuff. Whereas for me personally, I'm more interested in going somewhere that people don't go and uh, see what I can find. That to yeah. me is more exciting. Well, it's almost like a reward, isn't it? You've put in that work and then when, or even when you think about all those days where you didn't see something and then when you eventually do find that bird you're after or a surprise, it's just so much more rewarding for you. It is, it is. And, and I think also there's only certain, you only got a certain amount of time on this planet. And I'd rather use that time going to places that are not really talked about. So, you know, for example, I've, there's a couple of birding hotspots that people go to from Britain. Lesbos is one in Greece. And then also the Gambia is another example. I've not been to either mostly because I don't really want to be going to where, where everyone else goes. I want to, if I go, even if I go somewhere where everyone, everyone else goes, take me to somewhere that a few people go to within that area, you know? Yeah. So it's like even Spain, I mean, Extremadura, which is probably along with Andalusia and neighboring Portugal, Alentejo, one of the best places in Western Europe for birds. But when people come to Extremadura, they tend to go to the same places, Montfragüe, which is a, a mountain range where you know you get really great views of vultures and stuff. And believe me, it's amazing. And they go to Trujillo, which is an area of plains where you can look for sand grouse and different types of plants. But then there's 50 other places you can go to that no one else goes to because they, um, you know, they they go to, you know, the obvious places. And I think it's more interesting to go to the unobvious places because you often find the same birds, but with absolutely no one around, you know, which I think is much more rewarding. And also it helps in the general knowledge of distribution anyway, because then you find populations of birds that you may not necessarily realize were there before. So yeah, yeah me, no, definitely. I'm, I'm an explorer, but you also add into our knowledge. Yeah, well, when, I mean, certainly on a, on a UK scale, if you go somewhere like the Cairngorms, it's almost like you can look on a map where these, this is where you go to see this, this is where you go to see that. Be like, well, there must be a dozen other places where you can see that animal, but not have to queue for half an hour to see a, you know, a crested tit at the well-known site or whatever. So it's, it's quite nice if you can go off and find those places off the beaten track. And, and like you say, it's, it's much more rewarding to get those, those views or if you're a photographer, those, those images. Yeah, because um, the often the beaten track could also be urban, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like London, um, one of the classic, well, two classic places that people will go to straight away would be the London Wetland Centre or just outside of London, Rain and Marshes. You know, both really great places. But when I'm in London, if a rare bird turns up at the London Wetland Centre, which is literally to about a mile and a half south of my local patch, where the scrubs, I'm going to my local patch because... The other thing about birds is that migration occurs across a broad front. It doesn't just occur at the famous headlands like Dungeness and, you know, Spurn. Obviously, it occurs there in great numbers and it's fantastic, but it also occurs across a, a greater area. So if, you know, I remember one classic time, there were 11,000 spotted flycatchers at um, Portland Bill in Dorset. Um, <laughs> them, and I realised... But if I go to my patch two days later, I will see a microcosm, cosm, cosm, micro. Cosm? I'll see a small amount of that. Chasm? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see a small amount of that. And I did. I turned up two days, two days later and I saw 11 spotted fly catches, which is a, you know, a huge amount for my little patch. So it's not about chasing the crowds or chasing where things were last seen. So about thinking, well, if, if that's the case, then there must be a wider range of stuff elsewhere. 
And that's how you find things. And that's how you realize that, for example, on my patch, like one of the scrubs, that's how I realized that ring oozles, my favorite bird, turn up every year, every year. And I even work out the best times to see them because they turn up normally in the penultimate week of, of April. You can learn so much. And I think, it, it, I think it's good to have, to go to the mint mares of the world. I think it's great. But I think it's also good to have a local patch because it's so rewarding to find things um, that you hadn't seen there before. And over a period of time, you're going to find something that's really interesting, whether it be regional or even nationally. Yeah, no, I, I agree. There must be so many little patches of woodland or, or little, little rivers that aren't necessarily nature reserve, but they're going to have amazing wildlife for, for people to go, to go and see. I, I'm glad you mentioned ring oozles there. So what, what is it about the ring oozle that, that makes it your favourite bird? Because it's, you know, this mountain thrush, it's not as flashy or colourful as, say, bee eaters or wax wings, but why, why the ring oozle? Well, I was, when I was about six or seven, I went... I didn't really know much about names of birds. I was just, I, my apprenticeship was basically 15 years of uh, teaching myself and basically learning common birds. Um, but when I was seven, I found this book, Birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, which I actually have. I can show you that. There you go. That's the book. <laughs> yeah. And um, basically, it, I couldn't believe that there was over a thousand different species of bird. I didn't realize that they existed. So, I uh, read this book inside out, up, upside down, back to front. I knew every single page. I knew all the scientific names of all the birds. But when I came, there's a couple of uh, pages that really um, stuck out in my mind. One was the page with the um, harriers on it, because I was thinking, these birds are beautiful. They're all gray. And when will I ever get to see a harrier? You know, it's incredible. The other page was bustards. I was thinking to myself, wow, bustard, that is a, they're like, I'll never see that, that's incredible. And then the other page um, was the, the thrushes, which I'm, I'm frantically trying to find. <laughs> um, and I was really engaged when I saw um, the page featuring the ring oozle. I saw the blackbird, I knew the blackbird intimately, but then I saw this bird, I thought, that looks so familiar yet so different. So I'd read about it, I read about it here, and I realized that it was the, you know, the similarity in plumage was roughly the only similarity they, they had really and after that all bets were off I mean it, it's got a crap song as far as I'm concerned <laughs> it's, um, it's a summer visiting thrush compared to the blackbird which is resident even though obviously populations do come in the winter and stuff um, it's um, very wary and wild and shy it, it, it's a bird that's found in certain habitats in, in the wilder areas of the west and the north and I thought to myself, when on God's earth will I ever get to see this bird? So it became a mystical creature for me. Um, so when I did eventually see, I mean, I, I twitched one on the ceilings, but when I actually saw one on my local patch, it was like a biblical moment. I, I fell to my knees. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And then every year from that point on, I saw ring oozles passing through, apart from one year, when during the spring I didn't see one for love nor money. I mean, I actually, in the past, you know, I'll be there and suddenly I look up on the top of a poplar, there'll be a ring who's almost saying, how are you doing? And then moving straight on towards Scandinavia. Um, but this one spring I didn't see a single ring oozle and I was desperate. And, you know, during the summer I was, I felt absolutely awful. And then in the autumn, which they're actually much rarer in the autumn, I went out every single day in September practically looking for them, didn't see one. Every single day in October, didn't see one. October the 31st came and I was thinking, there's no way now, I can't believe I've gone a year without seeing a ring oozle. that's impossible, I can't believe this. But I went to bed that night uh, on the 31st and I had a dream that I found them on my local patch. And often when I give talks, I say, I had a dream, I had a dream. <laughs> anyway, I had a dream and I, I saw them. So I went to my local patch and um, and I walked around, it was a grey day, November the 1st, I was thinking, there's no way, I mean, they should all be, you know, in South Sahara or Morocco or wherever, um, Southern Europe. And I turned a corner and there was a dead tree, and in this dead tree were three ring oozles. <laughs> three. Uh, two of which stayed on to be the latest ring oozles in the whole of Britain that year. 
And that's on my open patch in West London, which again shows you that anything can turn up anywhere at any time. You don't have to be in the famous classic places. You know, it's, it pays to, to really take a look at some of the places that look interesting, but no one goes to. The gods of birding were obviously listening to you. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I was using the force. That's one yeah. thing. But secondly, um, I think I have a real connection with the ring user. I mean, a couple of years ago, I was in Seville doing a, writing an article for Birdwatching magazine on urban birding in, in, in Seville. And I remember walking, I didn't know anything about Seville. As I said earlier, there was nothing online. So I just went, looked at a map, saw a couple of green spots and went to them. And one of them was this park by the river, filled with people walking their dogs, holding hands, running around with kids and stuff. Very, and it was during the summer as well, or early summer. But I remember walking into this park walking around, I found a kingfisher, I found a brook with kingfishers and stuff, which was nice. And then I looked up and there, flying over my head, was a female ring user. You know? They're following um, you. And when I went to Spain for the first time anyway, when I started kind of hanging out here quite frequently, I remember one October, November, going to a, little, a small mountain range, which is about 45 minutes from Merida, which is where I am now, having lunch and walking into the foothills of this mountain, looking at the orchards and finding eight ring oozles. So I think we have a connection. <laughs> it's not a bad animal to have a connection with, is it? You know, <laughs> but it's leopard slug or something might be a bit worse, but you, um, we talk about favorite animals then. So you, you did the, in, in 2015, you did the national bird campaign. You might have already answered this. I was gonna say, what is your favorite to win? Was the ring oozle in it? Was that a contender? No, the way it was chosen was I, I didn't want to just have 10 birds that I chose. And then people say, well, what, why isn't that there? Why isn't this there? So it was a two part process. The first process, the first part of the process was 60 species that were voted on when I launched it in August 2014 by people at the bird fair. And then okay. within the birding fraternity. So, you know, people, members of the RSPB and all those guys. I think we got about 10,000 votes. And then it was cut down theoretically to six species. But then when I looked at the, the list, I realized that the hen harrier was 10th. And as you know, the hen harrier is a very contentious species in, that, in England that's been illegally hunted and there's far less than there should be. So I thought, you know what, I'll increase it to 10, including the hen harrier. Um, so there'd be nine species that people knew about and the 10th hen harrier and my thought was that people will then google it and hopefully an element of those people will join the cause as fresh blood which is what's needed and then i got criticized for this by the way because uh, I'm, 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 I'm an editor of a well-known magazine bird magazine not bird watching magazine another one no okay. uh, basically wrote saying this is a waste of time and yeah the effort should be spent getting people to sign the grouse um the grouse hunting um petition and I just thought you know that's a classic example of people who just don't think outside of their little world you know yeah. because what I was doing is actually bringing new people to their world I was also disappointed um, by the reaction to the majority of the NGOs that I approached because when I launched this whole thing I decided before launching to go to all the NGOs and say listen you know can you help me whether financially or any other way we can all club together and we can all get new members. Yeah. And I was shocked by the lack of interest. Uh, I was shocked by the lack of help I initially got. It shocked me because I thought, you know, this is for your benefit too, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So anyway, the first round went well. The second round, I, you know, had the top 10 and that was when I needed help, you know, financially and all that sort of stuff. And I had to use a lot of my money and also donations from friends. And a couple of the NGOs actually did help me, but not the ones that you'd think. And basically, basically, uh, I managed to find a PR woman who was really helpful. She, she kind of waived her costs, a lot of her costs. And she managed to get me, in the end, six to, I think, six million pounds worth of airtime and newspaper space. The idea, the clever idea behind all of this was to run it alongside the general election. Because yes. I knew that I couldn't really report on the general election, this would be a great and finally kind of moment. But the, the media loved it. And 
um, in the end, I managed to also involve schools because I thought to myself, this is interesting, it should be about kids. So I, I emailed all like 22,000 schools to get them to um, have a voting booth because my voting period was from March until May the 6th, which was the actual day of the election. And I also knew most people would be voting on the day of the election because I, I'd had that period of time to get people galvanized really because there'd be lots of media attention. But I said to the schools, why not have a voting booth within your school so that kids can vote on May the 6th, like their parents. And then they can learn about voting, they can learn about democracy, but they can also learn whilst they, whilst they start um, kind of researching what bird they want to vote for, vote for they can learn about birds. So that was the, the, the thinking. And in fact, the, the school vote, the kid vote, ch the children's votes affected the general vote because, okay, the Robin won, but um, um, second was the Blackbird, which is what I wanted to win. Okay. But kids' votes, the Harry Potter effect kicked in, and the Barn Owl just raced up the chart and was number two, kicking the Blackbird into third place. Um, but it was a great exercise. I mean, 250,000 people plus voted. So I managed to get a quarter million people to vote. Yeah, yeah huge 60%, achievement. 60% of them were not members of any NGO. So I just thought to myself, had the NGOs helped me, we could have maybe got 5 million people voting and they could have had a load more members. In fact, one NGO during the course of this vote, I called them and said, you know, there's, I've noticed that there's 5,000 of your members have voted, 5,000 of your 10,000 members have voted so far. And instead of them saying to me, right, that's a great opportunity to get new members, they said to me, oh, well, I hope the other half votes. <laughs> don't get it. And the other thing that was interesting from that whole process was the, I mean, there was a lot of love and a lot of people really into it, but most of the people into it were outside of the birding world. And I was getting some vitriolic emails from people saying, how dare you do this? Yeah. How dare you? And I was thinking, what do you mean? You know, how dare you? One, one email was, how dare you waste taxpayers' money? And I was thinking, I wish I was wasting taxpayers' money. You know? So it's interesting the amount of um, criticism you get yeah. for doing something which was basically meant to be fun and also to get people engaged. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I did... Um... Not, not as successful as yourself, but I did try to do a fish vote, which, which you very kindly you know, gave me some advice on. And yeah, no, exactly the same thing. I had people were like, who do you think you are to do this? And I was like, whoa, whoa, it's just, it's just a bit of fun, calm down. But they were, yeah, almost spitting venom at me because I was trying to pick one fish over the other. So it's, um, it's very strange. <laughs> so I can, I can wholly sympathize with you, David, on that. <laughs> I'm gonna leave on this last question anyway, which is, is there a species that you're yet to see that you would love to encounter? Because obviously you, you've been in a, an amazing situation where you've traveled all over the world. You've seen lots of amazing uh, creatures, not only birds. I know, I know you, you're a general naturalist as well as a bird watcher, but is there any one animal that you've not yet seen that you're like, that's the one I'd love to see? I think the one animal that if I saw, I'd probably burst into tears um, is the uh, puma, the cougar, because I've never seen one. It's my favorite animal above everything. Um, I've been okay. got a connection to Puma since I was a kid. I think I was close to one once in LA. I was walking in a, in a canyon and I decided to go off piste. And I remember hearing a sort of a, a large rustle behind me and I was thinking that doesn't sound like a deer. But then I thought it's my favorite animal. And even though I feel a bit nervous um, and I left the, the area, I, I feel that that was the closest I've ever been to a Puma. It'd be slightly but, ironic if it ate you. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think the puma is one animal that I'd love to see. Um, in terms of birds, I mean, I'm not really, I mean, I do keep lists. I mean, I've got my Spanish list and all that sort of stuff. But I'm not really a lister. So for someone who's traveled the world as much as I have, my list is fairly poor considering. But I'm not interested in just ticking things off and having, well, I've seen 5,000. I'm not really that interested in that. But there's a couple of species I'd love to see. And, and they are, well, one is definitely the Eskimo curlew which is probably deemed extinct anyway. Oh, but right. I have a feeling that there might be one or two kicking around still. Now, I'd, love to, I'd love to trace their journey. I'd love to go from the, 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 um, the tundra in Canada and then trace their journey across the Midwest, over to Texas, across the Gulf of Mexico, down into South America, and ending up in the Pampas 
I'd love to follow that journey and listen to some of the stories that people have along the way. Because the last time it was officially seen was in 1962, and there was an unofficial sighting in 1984 in Galveston, I think, in Texas. Um, and sort of unofficial sightings persist to this, to this day. So it's kind of a mystical creature. And it's one that I learned about as a kid, you know, when I was watching a cartoon called The Last of the Curlews, where um, a boy goes out hunting with his dad, and his dad shoots one bird, which turns out to be a female Eskimo curly, the last of them in the world, the male carries all migrating. And the boy nurses this curly back to health. And then come the autumn, the male's flying back north or oh, south or whatever. And um, the, um, it's actually flying south, yeah. And the female flies up to join him. Um, oh, wow. And he makes him cry as a you know, little kid. And that's when that love for that particular species got cemented in me. I've never even heard of that, that bird before. So that's one I'll have to, I'll have to go. Eskimo yeah. curly. Yeah, there used to be millions upon millions of them. They nested in the tundra and migrated in huge flocks. They used, to, they used to land in the Midwest when it wasn't so cultivated. In fact, it wasn't cultivated at all to feed on a type of grasshopper to fatten up. And that was when they were shot by uh, European settlers en masse. We called them, I think they used to call them mutton birds because they were all fattened up. And okay. I killed them en masse to the point that it's wiped them out. So it's a, it's a lesser known story, but it's the same story as the, uh, the passenger pigeon, basically. Just yeah. wiped out, out of existence. And, and on that rather somber and depressing note, we'll end, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll end the podcast. Well, look, David, it's always a pleasure talking to you, buddy. I've really enjoyed that. And it's really interesting to hear some more aspects about what you do. So take care and I'm sure we'll bump into each other at some point. Yeah, looking forward to that, Jack. Thanks for thinking of me, and uh, you, you, uh, you take care too, and I, I can see you going all the way, mate. I'll try. <laughs> Cheers, man. That was David Lindo, and I find his passion quite infectious. I'd recommend checking out his webinar series, In Conversation. There's lots of great interviews on there. On to Nature Reserve of the Week, and this week it's Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. It's located in East Sussex, close to the Kent border, and is managed by Sussex Wildlife Trust. It's a mosaic of coastal habitats, shingle, salt marsh, saline lagoons, coastal grazing marsh, freshwater gravel pits, and reed beds, and in total, it's 465 hectares. Now, it was voted Britain's favourite nature reserve in 2016 in the third annual Land Love Magazine Awards, and having been there a few times, it is a spectacular place to visit. Undoubtedly, though, it's the birds most people visit here for, with masses of waders like avocets, red shank and plovers, but it's an incredibly biodiverse reserve, with 4,275 species of plants and animals recorded, with 200 of them being rare or endangered birds and mammals. At present, the facilities are fairly basic. There's a hut with a sightings board, and a few gifts available with five hides, all with good accessibility, but there is a centre that is well underway, the Rye Harbour Discovery Centre. Now it's going to sell art and produce from local artists, crafters, local books, as well as a wide range of wildlife related products. They're going to have a varied menu with coffee machine and all kinds of stuff that you're going to, going to want when you're walking around these places. So the calf's going to be a big draw for people, particularly the views, because they've got massive windows for you to overlook the reserve and you can spot wildlife while you're enjoying a coffee and a slice of cake. Now, of course, nearby you've got Rye itself, and there are places like the Avocet Tea Room. There's also a local pub called the Inkerman Arms, which is pretty good. So there's lots of things nearby as well. Parking's uh, available. There's a large car park and some public toilets. So on the whole, it's not too bad a resort. It's got everything you kind of need in terms of facilities, some amazing wildlife, because the hides are pretty close. So if you're a photographer like me, you can get some nice images. And with it being a fairly open landscape, it's fairly easy to spot the wildlife. So if you've never been to Rye Harbour Nature Reserve, give it a visit. It is a phenomenal place. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. I've been Jack Perks. This has been the Bearded Tits podcast. And I will catch you in the next one. Cheers.